Hi, I'm Gene Morano. On today's show, you'll get to know the Taubman Museum of Art's new executive director, and a long-distance runner talks about the Boston Marathon and the personal struggles she has overcome. Our guests are Adela Watkins from the Taubman Museum and Pam Rickard. Della Watkins is the third executive director at the Taubman Museum of Art in downtown Roanoke, which has had its share of public relations and financial issues since opening the doors in 2008. Optimistic and upbeat by nature, Watkins majored in art and art education at James Madison and then Virginia Commonwealth Universities. She came to Roanoke recently from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, where she was the chief education officer in her last position after a 15-year career there. Della Watkins believes she can help get the Taubman back on more solid ground, in large part by further engaging the local community. Della Watkins, welcome to the interview. Thank you. What prompted you to make this big move from Richmond, um, you know, despite what you might have heard about the, the museum's financial conditions? What, what was it that excited you about coming to the Taubman? Well, I'm very familiar with the Taubman because when I worked at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, the Taubman is a full statewide partner. And in that relationship, I've traveled out here many times to you know, help with different um, aspects, sort of technical assistance mm -hmm. as needed. And the Taubman you know, has great potential, has a big heart, mm -hmm. and it just felt right for me to come and, and uh, be with it. Mm -hmm. As far as the future goes, do you see more of a reciprocal arrangement where you might see more pieces coming down from we, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts? Well, you better believe I know that collection top to bottom. Uh -huh. I haven't been there for 15 years. And the good news is we are a statewide partner. The bad news for the uh, VMFA is I'm going to know what to ask for. Right, right. And they have a, a fabulous collection. And yes, as, as statewide partners, we will be, we will be loaning and lending. Mm -hmm. You wound up at the, as the chief educator, I think, at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. Are museums, art museums, are, are museums largely about education to some extent? Well, that's one of their and most... And you were a teacher, too, in I, your past life. I am, uh -huh. and I'm a teacher to my toes. Uh -huh. And, you know, in that, in that um, sort of career, uh, teachers are nurturing, they're well-organized, they're, you know, uh, in take charge kind of people. And what I saw at um, VMFA was it's one third of their mission. So, you know, we always need to collect art, we always need to take care of it, and we always need to interpret it. So mm -hmm. that's the job of an educator. 
So, you know, the field is trending where mm -hmm. um, museum leaders are, you know, they could be business people, they could be curators, they can be art historians. What's well, trending to more business and education because its primary mission is to, mm -hmm. to interpret the works. You've made some changes. One of the changes which, uh, as we go to taping, this will probably have already happened, but um, uh, the cafe is going to be open on late. Nora's Cafe on, yeah, on, on we're, we're happy Thursday to nights. Thursday nights. It's called Thursday Night Live. Uh -huh. So that'll be open starting uh, in, in June. Uh -huh. uh, every Thursday, we're committing to every single week, so it's open till 9 o'clock. It's, mm -hmm. it's just a chance to come in and have a tapas, to uh -huh. enjoy your friends, slip mm -hmm. up to the galleries. We did the, uh, we did the gift shop a little bit? We did the gift okay. shop, so I'm happy to say we re-merchandised. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of new things coming in, new format in there. Uh -huh. So I hope people will, will come by and, and give, it a, give it a look. Mm -hmm. And also a new tagline, uh, your place to be. Talk about what that means to you as far as the Taubman. Well, one of my goals certainly is for the Taubman to be accessible to everyone. So that means those that uh, work during the day, that, that those that have families, everyone, young professionals. So in order to make it accessible, we, we had to change our hours a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the commitment to be open on Thursday nights is uh, just an opportunity for people after work to come and socialize and, and uh -huh. to visit the galleries. Now, uh, David Mickenberg, when he was here, they, they, the Taubman went to a free admission policy. Mm -hmm. Do you see that policy continuing in the future? Oh, if, if I can, yes, that would be my absolute goal. Mm -hmm. You know, the free admission um, s sort of is, we're wrestling with, you know, the value of having free admission and membership and what that means. And what I, what I want our community to understand is that, or, or to, to believe that the Tallman is free of charge and open for everyone. Mm -hmm. So our memberships support having the lights on and the art right. traveling and things there. So the free admission will continue. Uh -huh. um, then members will be able to have discounted opportunities. Well, what one, yeah, I wanted to ask you, what's the benefit of being, because I've been a member in the past, and quite frankly, I just haven't got around to Okay, it. but well, I know that's your I can homework. walk in now. <laughs> but what's the benefit of being a member still? It, it, it is, and so it'll be discounts for the um, uh, cafe and the um, shop, things like that. But it also, it's going to be a chance to have reduced tickets on everything else, whether it be a fancy concert or a big speaker or mm -hmm. an afternoon event. So that'll be. But you know, the bigger message is I really want our community to embrace their fine arts museum. Mm -hmm. In order for me to bring visual arts and experiences from all over the world mm -hmm. and, and keep it uh, safe and secure, um, we, we have a great big building there, right. and that building requires a lot of security and a lot of care, and, and in mm -hmm. order to do that, our membership um, helps support that. You know, one of the, I know I talked to you before, one of the things you talked about, Della, was really engaging the community, engaging local artists, and since you came aboard earlier this year, what have, what have people in the community or local artists, what have they told you that they want the Taubman to be? Well, I'm, I'm, Gene, I'm doing a lot of listening. Uh -huh. So right now You're on I your listening to, tour, huh? Yeah, I'm on the listening tour. And it's gathering that data and, you know, and I'm getting a few pushbacks and I'm getting yeah. lots of suggestions and everybody wants to display their work there. Uh -huh. But what I'm trying to help um, the community understand and, and me and sort of also understand is that, you know, we have a curatorial staff. We have missions and goals. You know, there will be things that we can and cannot do. But, you know, every artist, of course, wants a chance to show their work. So I would like to put together a five-year portfolio of exhibitions, things that we can look far out and vary that menu so it's historical, it's local, mm -hmm. it's international, it's spectacle, it's banner, it's fun. Right. So in all of that um, uh, planning, you know, I've been talking to artists, you know, what artists do I select? Why can't everyone be there? Well, uh, as you can imagine, it's a curatorial process. Right, right, right. And the thing is, I guess you want to balance more regional and local art with nationally known artists and bigger exhibits, perhaps. Right, and you know, when I have five exhibits in the building at a time, it's very well planned. So they have some relationship. They're either thematic, maybe they're all Virginia artists at that time, or uh -huh. all you know Virginia origins. So each time we put together sort of this um, seasonal. So we sort of have like a spring, summer, and fall rotation. Right. And you know, my local artists will be in my Southwest artists or, or Virginia's Blue Ridge artists. Mm -hmm. They'll be um, merging right into that that full menu of, of, of programming. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the challenges, I think, of a museum like the Taubman is how do you get people back in the door? You know, the, they come the first time, they look at the funky architecture, and they see, <laughs> but how do you get them back? And is it a matter 
partly Della of rotating exhibits more, getting new things, having openings for new exhibits? Well, the model is exhibitions drive attendance. So I have to keep it fresh. We have to stagger the exhibition so every time you come, there's a new experience. Mm -hmm. So the, the past model had a little bit of opening and closing things at the same time so you could celebrate one, you know, five things opening at one time. Well, over time, people sort of fizzle out because they've seen it. Right. So we're never going to have a gallery, um, more than two galleries closed at a time so that we always have something new. You know, and it is my job to put things in there, and when, you, when I finally get you in the door, that you have a great experience. Mm. So that means you might stumble on an artist demonstration that day or, or, or slip onto a guided tour or go in for a glass of wine at the cafe. Mm. But, you know, the whole idea of being a place to be, um, fun, whether you're there for a reflective moment, whether you're there to meet a friend. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's a facility that I hope people will think about using and, and come often. You know, Center in the Square, as we go to taping, Center in the Square is about to uh, mm -hmm. reopen. There's a bunch of museums there and some really cool fish tanks. And <laughs> can, can the Taubman, which is two blocks away, can you benefit at all, vi and vice versa? The syn can there be a synergy between Center in the Square and, and, and the top. Well, we already have great partnerships. So, for instance, since the butterflies aren't quite ready to be born, we're going to have the science museum. Yeah, right? We're going to have the the children at the Taubman in classes make butterflies and participate in okay. and, and having some of those. So we work really closely with that. The Harrison Museum is borrowing. Um, uh, pedestals and displays from us to get to, to help them. They're moving into the center of the square, right? Moving into uh -huh. center of the square. So you know, anything that we can do to partner. And I've been down there and we've looked at how we can, you know, sell tickets together. Somebody comes for one-stop shopping. Right. Um, how our hours will jive or not jive. And you know, if I'm going to be open on Thursday nights, would they like to be? So it's. I, I see it as only a great partnership because mm -hmm. the more people we, we have downtown and the more opportunities people have, mm -hmm. and we're, we're two blocks away or a right. block and a half away. Right. So I hope they'll, they'll um, go can, back and forth. Right. You can make it an all-day cultural experience. It is. Right. How, um, in, in a city the size of Roanoke or in a valley like this, how important is it, Adela, that cultural organizations work together? We have to work together. You know, there are eight counties that, that touch the, the Roanoke area. You know, I, I have relationships with Virginia Tech and Highlands and the, and the um, uh, Higher Arts Center. You know, I, we really need people to, to um, understand that the strong, our partnerships make us stronger. And in that, in that strength, that's sharing volunteers, not just sharing money. It's, it's sharing resources and expertise and technical assistance and talents and all the things that make, um, make, make us stronger. Mm -hmm. So my partnerships extend from the corporate community to the educational community, our, our school systems. Mm -hmm. um, students come in into the building with the highest hopes of enriching their curriculum, seeing primary resources. You know, it's the funniest thing. Kids think the Internet right. is a primary resource. Right. You know, here I show them something that's, you know, a thousand years old or made at the hand of a craftsman. They're like, what? Well, well they say, I saw that on the Internet. That's right. right. That's much smaller than what I thought. Right. <laughs> And just to kind of wrap up here, um, are you optimistic about the future, long-term future for the Taubman? Well, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was just a, a radiant, another star in this city. Mm -hmm. uh, I really feel like um, between the community and the staff is strong, and, and people want to see that, that to be a successful institution. I want to instill pride, make sure that people talk about the Taubman, enjoy it, come there, are treated to... Um, lifetime changing experiences. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I might be an optimist, but I'm going to give it all I have to make it go. Sounds like it. We'll have to leave it there. Della Watkins, thank you no, for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. This is The Interview. I'm Gene Morano. We'll be right back.
Pam Rickard studied journalism at Ohio University and has extensive background in public relations, advertising, and financial development. She's probably best known now in local circles as a long-distance runner, recently completing a double Blue Ridge Marathon, more than 52 miles back-to-back. She also ran the 2013 Boston Marathon, finishing just minutes before the bombs went off, killing three spectators. Now Pam Rickard is Vice President of Marketing for RunWell, the Linda Quirk Foundation, which encourages people to overcome drug or alcohol addictions by partnering with activities like running. Pam Rickard knows all about some of those struggles. Pam Rickard, welcome to the interview. Thank you. I want to talk about the Boston Marathon. Uh, you were at the Boston Marathon, and this is your finisher's badge and your, yes. your passport this year. And you completed the Boston Marathon, I guess about 20 minutes before the bomb went off. You weren't near the finish line. What was your first reaction when you comprehended what was going on? Um, shock, of course, and um, confusion. Uh, I found out from my daughter, my oldest daughter texted me. Actually, they knew before I did, even though I was just uh, four blocks away from the actual bombing. I didn't hear the bomb. I heard um, tons of sirens and, and lots of commotion. Uh, I was standing outside uh, the place where I stayed. I actually stayed at the YWCA, mm -hmm. which is a type of a hostel, right. about four, mile, four blocks from the finish line. <clears throat> I was standing outside the building getting ready to walk in, and I had a text from my daughter that just said, are you okay? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And I said, and I texted back, I'm fine. What's, what do you mean? Right. And the text didn't go through. And then uh, my phone, I had s tons of notifications, calls trying to come in. Mm -hmm. Nothing was, was coming in because evidently they had blocked all cell service. Right. So, um, so I truly didn't know what was going on. I went up to my room and um, we did have wireless and uh, I learned everything from Facebook. Right. Did you ever think anything like this would happen at a marathon? No. Did it ever cross your mind in New York or Boston? or No. It, it's ironic because, yes, I've run Boston four times now, New York four times, um, several other uh, larger events even outside the country. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's um, a sense of innocence or maybe even a little bit of ignorance, but I, I, even though these events are... Um, are open to everyone. Um, there's there's great security. Mm -hmm. I think because there's such a sense of optimism and it's such a positive environment that right. you don't expect terrorism. Now I know um, you came back here. You ran a double Blue Ridge Marathon. I did. You started at two in the morning, ran, and then you started again at seven thirty. Yeah, we started at two thirty. Two thirty. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> ran. It, sorry. We slept in until one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you were interviewed by local TV and by ESPN for one of their programs. It basically said was you're not going to stop running, that we don't give in to things like this? And Correct. Talk about your feelings about the, what yes. they were trying, you know. Yes, I don't want to come across as, as uh, you know, um, crass or, or, or unfeeling about it because I do, I do have a sense of, um, I mean, my heart obviously is still so heavy, so heavy with, mm -hmm. the, with the whole, um, the, the fact that something like that can occur. But uh, as I said um, on, on ESPN, I feel like we need to be uh, we need to be vigilant. We need to be um, we need to be intelligent and cautious, but not um, not operate out of fear. So um, I, I, I actually folks were asking me <clears throat> between the week of, of you know Boston and Blue Ridge, are you going to are you still going to run Blue Ridge? Aren't you afraid to run it? And it didn't even cross my mind. Um, because first of all, of course, not all, the Blue Ridge Marathon is, is an extremely safe environment as right. it is. You're in Roanoke, but right. in Roanoke, but but the, um, the the security was increased as 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 I'm sure it's going to be for events from now on, right. especially um, running events. But um, but it also is it's it's such a positive. Um, uh, in, uh, energetic environment, and um, and it was something that I I know that we cannot we can't change what happened. Mm -hmm. We can't take back those lives. We can't fix the, the those folks that were permanently injured, but we can overcome it with good. And that's what um, I, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do mm -hmm. the marathon, especially the double. Because and someone had said to me, well, why would you do it? And I said because I can and um, not in a in a cocky overconfident way but mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that I can run it all mm -hmm. so to be able to to have an opportunity to do it twice mm -hmm. 
and, and to feel that to feel uncomfortable. I mean, right. for me, I liked that feeling. I liked feeling that the pain and the and Especially the Especially knowing what some of the people in Boston went through. Exactly. Right. That here I'm choosing it. Right. I get to choose to do it right. instead of instead of have to, to have it forced right. it on me about, uh, by something evil. Right. Talk about um, Pam. What long distance running has meant to you. Now you've had some personal struggles in the past. Oh yes. And and talk about if you can touch on that and talk about what running has meant to you. Yes. Thank you for asking that. And uh, long story short, and I, I, we would never have enough time here for me to, to really express uh, where I've been and, and where I'm continuing to go because it is a journey. But um, I am in recovery, and I'm a recovering alcoholic, seven years sober now. And, uh, and I was um, what, what they is termed a very high-functioning alcoholic. Um, I, uh, it, it is a progressive disease. It doesn't um, happen, come on overnight, but it, it, it was a very slow progress for me um, to the point where I did have quite a bit of success um, academically, mm -hmm. professionally. Um, a beautiful family, husband and three daughters who, thank God, we are very, 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 very uh -huh. uh, strong right. and um, in recovery mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but um, and I even I was very active in my running. I had quite a bit of uh, success locally as just a recreational runner. Right. But um, I ran seven marathons active in my alcoholism. I um, I qualified for Boston four times. Never ran Boston during my active alcoholism. But I was able to get away with it, and um, which actually kept me sicker longer because mm -hmm. I denied it. I never drank when I was pregnant, breastfeeding, or training for a marathon. So I thought I had it under control, but uh, I did not. So um, when I eventually went into treatment um, at the Farley Center in Williamsburg in uh, 2006, ironically, I went into treatment on Marathon Monday um, in 2006. It was April 17th, <clears throat> and, and uh, my husband Tom and I were driving to Williamsburg, and I remember hearing, um, I checked in uh, at 3 p.m., and so at around noon we were driving, from Roanoke to Williamsburg, and they had uh, the news coverage of the Boston Marathon was on the radio. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking, you know, and honestly, I was I was ready to surrender to this, but I was I was I was a broken person, and I was just quietly tears were falling down my face. And I remember thinking, the Boston Marathon is going on right now. I'm a marathon runner, and I'm going to treatment for alcoholism. What is what is going on? Right. What has happened? So, <clears throat> again, pushing ahead quite a bit. Long story short, I was very grateful to find my foundation for recovery, uh, which I uh, which I work on a daily basis now. Right. But um, when I eventually um, regained my physical health and began walking again, I I started running a little bit again, and um, I still loved running. I mean, right. I'm a runner, and I, I it's just a way that God has wired me and made mm -hmm. me. So, I um, admittedly I did not put running. Um, uh, on the on the table right away though I, I spent three years basically staying home not driving working um, on, for freelance free, working on freelance jobs and mm -hmm. focusing on my recovery so uh, running was not a priority for me but after a while um, I did start running a little bit again and I can't even describe to you how grateful I was mm -hmm. to even run at all right. let alone get it back as, right. and so uh, eventually, I, I decided I wanted to run one more marathon, and Tom and I talked about it. And I, you know, I had run seven marathons, and I decided I'd love to run one clean. Even though I had never run a marathon physically drunk, right. I had felt like um, I had not run one with integrity mm -hmm. and um, authenticity. So mm -hmm. I wanted to run one yeah. more. So that's when I entered the uh, 2007 New York City right. Marathon, which I ended up running. And so now my kids joke because since t since that marathon, I've run. Um, 22 more marathons. Wow. So, I've run, so I've run, I ran 22 marathons in sobriety, but that, so mm. it's very, very much a gift. Just have a couple minutes left in the New York Marathon. Your 2007 run was uh, highlighted in the book, A Race Like No Other. Correct. You, your struggles and over, to overcome everything chronicled in the book with some other people. And now you're to the point where you, you're, you work for Run Well. Yes. Talk about that quickly. And you've gotten to the point where you've run uh, multi-day 155-mile yes, races I, in the Gobi Desert in China. I was very blessed to be connected with Run Well, which is a foundation that raises recovery um, awareness and, fun, and uh, funding for, for recovery uh, resources. And, um, <clears throat> and we do that through uh, running events primarily. So it's really it's a brand new concept. Um, Run Well is just a, 
uh, two years old now, mm -hmm. and but um, we've actually given out over a hundred thousand dollars last year in scholarships and in uh, grants for scholarships. And for that's what you were raising money for. When exactly. You were and okay. so what I when I um, signed up to run the Gobi Desert for Run Well, I did it as a volunteer. That led to my becoming an ambassador, which led to my um, sitting on the board, which now leads to my work uh, part time for them uh, as a VP of marketing. And um, <clears throat> it is a it is a natural fit for me because of the running component and the recovery component. Mm -hmm. But um, the beauty of it is 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 the truth is is if I could say one thing, it is that addiction is tragic. It's not going anywhere. Unfortunately, it is on the rise, and it is somewhat of an epidemic in our society. <clears throat> Addictions of all kinds. But the real truth is that I have learned through my own uh, experience and uh, as well as professionally is that recovery is even more powerful. So it needs to be accepted on an individual basis. It needs to be talked about, it needs to be funded, and it needs to be, um, it needs to be, uh, it needs to be part, of, uh, part of what we talk about. Uh -huh. So that's why I'm so passionate about it. Not just because addiction is bad and we need to, we need to treat it, mm -hmm. but because recovery is even more powerful. And the ripple effects of that for our individuals, families, and communities mm -hmm. Is 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 beyond what what we can ever even. Right. Uh, so you've got a lot more for. roads and trails to conquer out there. I do. Yeah. Yes, God willing. I mean, I'm very healthy. I'm healthier now than I ever was, so I want to use that for good. Mm -hmm. Pam uh, Rickard, good to see you again. Thank you so much for appreciate having it. me. Thank I appreciate you. it. Our guests have been Taubman Museum of Art Executive Director Della Watkins and long distance runner Pam Rickard. I'm Gene Morano. You can look for me in the Roanoke Star newspaper, Play by Play magazine, and in Valley Business Front. And listen for me Saturday and Sunday mornings at 11.30 on Roanoke This Week on Fox Radio 910 AM. Don't forget you can watch segments of the interview on YouTube. Just search by my name. Until next time, take care.